Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, Pillars of the Faith is the second in our series. Last uh, time we did the essentials of the faith. Now this is the pillars of the faith. And the pillars of the faith are the uh, rational and uh, evidence ground on which Christianity rests. You, you may say, why examine the pillars of the faith? Why not just believe? Uh, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And we add, and we had a little bumper sticker once, uh, the unexamined faith is not worth believing. There are a lot of unexamined faiths in the world. I talked uh, to a young Mormon one night, and he said, uh, as I was pointing out contradictions in Mormonism, he said, uh, if the Book of Mormon told me there were square circles, I would believe it. Well, of course, you can't do much for somebody uh, who has an irrational faith, and we don't have an irrational faith. Uh, the Bible doesn't say, leap before you look, or take a leap of faith in the dark. It says, take a step of faith in the light. And I liken it to two elevators. One elevator with the light on, and a man walking out of it. The other elevator with no light, and uh, you can't even see if there's a floor there, and nobody walking out of it. Uh, we're not asked to close our eyes and jump in the elevator with no light, because there might not be a floor there. We're asked to open our eyes, Look at the evidence. A man just walked out. Looks like there's a solid floor there and take a step in. That's why we're examining the uh, pillars of our faith. In fact, uh, it's part of the great commandment. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So it's actually a command to think through our faith. It's a command to think about what we believe. Philippians 4, Paul said, whatever things are true, think on these things. Apostle Peter said, set apart or sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is where we get our word apologetics, which means to give a defense from this very uh, verse. Give a defense for uh, the hope that is in you. Now, what are the pillars of the Christian faith? Well, there's the pillar of truth. Uh, we're going to have uh, very shortly in front of our building here a sign that's all complete, and it's going to say, I have a Bible on one side, and it'll say, Timeless Truths for. And it'll say, Welcome in the middle, and on the other side, it'll have a, a kind of clock, and it'll say, For Truthless Times. And that's what we have. We have timeless truth for truthless times. And so that's one of the pillars of the faith. We believe in truth, in absolute truth, in objective truth, and we're willing to defend it. Another pillar of our faith is God. Everything that we believe sooner or later goes back to God. We believe the Bible is the Word of God, but you can't have a Word of God unless you have a God who can have a Word. We believe Christ is the Son of God, but you can't have a Son of God unless there's a God who can have a Son. We believe in miracles called acts of God, but you can't have acts of God if you don't have a God who can act. So everything eventually goes back to this pillar. Uh, does God exist? And if he does, what kind of God exists? The third pillar of our faith is miracles. Most of the objection to Christianity that comes from the modern intellectual world comes from the fact that they have bought into an anti-supernatural point of view. From the time of David Hume, uh, who died incidentally the same year our country was born, 1776. From the time of David Hume to the present, uh, an anti-supernatural uh, spell has been cast on the intelligentsia of the Western world. Miracles simply are not credible. And if you pick up a book and it's filled with miracles, people walking on water, turning water into wine, multiplying loaves, resurrecting the dead, uh, I don't see that happening in the world today. Therefore, uh, miracles didn't happen pa in the past. And if you find a book that says they did, it can't be a credible book. We're going to examine that pillar. The fourth pillar of our faith is the Bible. Everything that we believe is based on the fact that this is a book from God, that this is the inspired Word of God. But is it trustworthy? Uh, is it accurate? Can we really trust that when it says Jesus said something, He really said it? 
Is the Bible the word of God or is it just the words of men about God or the words of men about some supposed God that exists? And finally, the fifth and fundamental pillar of our faith is Jesus Christ. Is he really the Son of God? Could any human being really now be God's Son? Isn't that incredible to say that somebody who was born of a woman could really be the creator of the universe? That's pretty hard to swallow for many people, and yet it's one of the pillars of our faith. Let's start with the first pillar, the pillar of truth. Well, I answer several questions. What is truth? Is truth absolute? And can we know the truth? By the way, the answer to that by our generation is uh, that we don't know the nature of truth. It could be many things. Basically, it's what works for you to the pragmatist. It's what somebody intends to be true for the intentionalist. It's what grabs me for the existentialist. There are many different definitions of truth. What's true for me is not necessarily true for you. So the second question, is truth absolute? If it's true for me, is it true for everybody? If it's true for everybody uh, in every place at every time, then it would be an absolute truth. But are there really any absolute truths? I mean, uh, I feel warm, you may feel cold. Uh, there's no absolute truth. Everything is relative, we're told. And can opposites both be true? Seems rather strange that in our so-called rational generation that people would actually believe that opposites can both be true. You've seen the yin-yang symbol. Looks like a black and white uh, tadpole getting cozy, you know. Uh, there's a black dot in the white one and there's a white dot in the black one. Uh, you've heard of the Star Wars series, Luke Skywalker, uh, when he cut off the head of Darth Vader, he had tapped into the light side of the force, Darth Vader, the dark side of the force. He cuts off Darth Vader's head and he looks in, he sees his face. Because I'm you, you're me, we're all God. Uh, there is no such thing as opposites uh, being uh, different. Everything is really one. Pilate asked the question, uh, he had a sneer, no doubt, in his uh, voice. Ironically, the truth was standing before him when he said, what is truth? But we want to answer the question now. We want to answer the question and show that there is truth, and you can define it, and we can know what it is. Truth is what matches its object. If I say to you, I have a brown Bible in my left hand, that statement is true because there's an object there, a brown Bible. So the statement about it is true because it corresponds with its object. Truth is what corresponds to the facts. Uh, if I say that it is a fact uh, that uh, George Washington was the first president of the United States, you can research it historically and find out whether or not that's true. And you'll find that there was a person named George Washington. He was the first president of the United States. So the statement is true. Or to put it in everyday language, truth is telling it like it is. Truth is telling it like it is. If you tell it like it is, you're telling the truth. And if you don't tell it like it is, you're not telling the truth. For example, uh, this object is a table. It's telling it like it is because that's a table. If it was a chair, the statement would be false. If it was a bed, the statement would be false. Anything but a table it would be false. Truth is telling it like it is. Now somebody may say, well, I, I'd like to challenge your definition of truth. I don't think truth is telling it like it is. Truth is not telling it like it is. Then we say to him, isn't that telling it like it is? I mean, that statement that truth is not telling it like it is, he supposes that that's really telling it like it is. So he's really telling it like it is to tell you that truth is not telling it like it is. But if he's telling it like it is, then truth must be telling it like it is. Or here's one, you've heard this, there is no truth to which we respond. Is that true? I mean, how can you say there is no truth when you're claiming that's true? And if you're claiming that's true, then there is uh, truth. When you catch on to this, it's more fun than a Sunday school picnic because you can line them up and knock them down, uh, skeptics, agnostics, whoever comes along. You can't know the truth. That's an agnostic. He says you can't know the truth, to which we uh, add, how do you know that's true? 
I mean, he's claiming that that's true, that you can't know that anything is true. So he does know the truth or he wouldn't be able to make that statement. It's true for me, but not for you. It's not true for everybody. It's just true for me. Well, ask that person this. Is that true for you or is that true for everybody? He's making a statement that he thinks everybody should accept, that there is no statement that everybody should accept. I mean, if that statement is true for everybody, then he can't say that there is no statement that's true for everybody because he just gave you one that he thinks is true for everybody. There is no absolute truth. By this part, uh, uh, time, you've already caught on to it and you know what to say. Is that absolutely true? There is no absolute truth. Is that absolutely true? Now notice in just a few minutes what we did. We established one of the most fundamental pillars of our faith because we believe there's absolute truth and that you can know it. And we showed that anyone who denies that there is truth is affirming truth. Anyone who denies that there's absolute truth is affirming an absolute truth. Absolute truth is literally undeniable. We did what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we should do. We destroy arguments in every proud obstacle uh, that exalts itself uh, against the knowledge of God. The skeptic says, well, you should doubt everything. Don't come to any dogmatic conclusions. Uh, just be humble and doubt everything. Well, I just want to know one thing. Should I doubt that? You see, if you doubt doubt, where are you? You're back to knowing something for sure. Why shouldn't I be skeptical about skepticism? The skeptic wants me to be skeptical about everything except skepticism. The agnostic wants me to be agnostic about everything except agnosticism. Well, I choose to be agnostic about agnosticism, which means I can know something for sure. I choose to be skeptical about skepticism, which means I can know something for sure. The skeptic, the agnostic, the relativist are all absolutely unequivocally uh, uh, sure of their position. Opposites are both true, the yin and the yang, the light and the dark side of the force. Uh, if you go to a Zen Buddhist, take a lesson in Zen Buddhism, and you say to the Zen Buddhist master, what is the Tao, T-A-O? That's the ultimate, that's their surrogate for God. What is the Tao? The Zen Buddhist master will say, uh, the Tao is one hand clapping. And you say, Master, one hand can't clap. It takes two hands to clap. And he'll say, now you begin to understand. And you say, begin to understand what? He th is trying to teach that there are no such thing as opposites. That's just lower level thinking, as Francis Schaeffer said. Down here on this level, there's true and false and right and wrong and good and evil. But on the highest level, there is no difference between good and evil, true or false. Just down, it's like one hand clapping. Now, what do we say to somebody who says opposites are both true? You say, is the opposite of that true? Oh, no, the opposite of that's not true. Well, you just told me that uh, opposites are both true. But you're not admitting that the opposite of that statement is true. Uh, you're saying the opposite of that statement is false. But that's exactly what I told you. The opposite of true is false. So even the person who says opposites are both true does not believe that the opposite of his statement is true. Therefore, he doesn't really believe what he says. Uh, it is uh, a false position. Opposite of true is false. There was a famous Muslim philosopher who got his point across very well to anyone who denied this law of non-contradiction that opposites cannot both be true at the same time in the same sense. He said, if anyone denies this, then just beat him and burn him until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as not to be beaten, and to be burned is not the same as not to be burned. Pretty uh, good and quick way to convince a skeptic that opposites are not uh, both true at the same time in the same sense. So the pillar of truth, what have we discovered? There is truth, 
You can know it, and it's absolutely true. It's true for somebody, it's true for everybody, and opposites can't both be true. Truth corresponds with the facts. Truth is true for everyone. We can know the truth, and opposites can't both be true. This is undeniable. You try to deny any one of those statements, and you have to affirm the statement. Therefore, we have a solid foundation for our belief in absolute truth. The pillar of truth, the pillar of God. Does God exist? And if so, what kind of God exists? This is a fundamental question. Can we know the truth? Yes, we can know truth. Well, now, is it true that God exists? And if a God does exist, what kind of God exists? Because there are many different kinds of gods. There's polytheism and finite godism and deism and theism, many different kinds of gods. Well, basically, there are three views of God. Theism, pantheism, and atheism. Theism says God made all, the hand holding up the world. He created the world. Pantheism says God is all, the hand is the world. And atheism says there is no God at all. There's a world, but no God. Carl Sagan said uh, the cosmos is everything that ever was, is, and will be. Those three views, by the way, were all found in Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 when Paul was preaching. Paul was a theist, monotheist, and he was talking to Epicureans and Stoics. The Epicureans were atheists and the Stoics were pantheists. What's the difference between an atheist and a pantheist? An atheist says all is matter. A pantheist says all is mind. The medieval teacher said to his class, what is matter? One student said, never mind. He said, what is mind? He said, no matter. Uh, that's it. That's the difference between atheists and a pantheist. Uh, one says all is mind. One says all is matter. What does a theist say? Mind made matter. Even uh, Karl Marx, the famous father of modern Marxism, said there are two basic views. Either matter produce mind or mind produce matter. Now, it makes no sense that the lower can produce the higher because a, an, a cause or an effect cannot rise higher than its cause. So it makes more sense to say mind produce matter. But which of these views is true, and how do we know? I'd like to give you three reasons why I believe theism is true. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, Isaiah 118. One reason is the universe had a beginning. And everything that has a beginning has a beginner. Second reason is life is in, uh, shows incredible design. But incredible design takes an incredible designer. Three, there is an objective moral law. But you can't have an objective moral law without a moral law giver. By the way, all three of those reasons are alluded to in the Bible. The universe had a beginning. Romans 1, 19 and 20, creation reveals that there is a creator. Life is incre uh, incredible design, that there's design in the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In Psalm 19, 1. There is an objective moral law, Romans 2, 12 to 15. There's a law written in their hearts, and there must be a law giver. Let's take these one by one. The first reason, everything that had a beginning had a cause. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. Now the first statement, everybody knows intuitively is true. Can't come to be without a cause. Nothing happens willy-nilly. That's the fundamental law of science. Francis Bacon, the father of modern science in 1620, when he wrote the book that gave rise to modern science, Novum Organum, said, this is what science is all about, a search for causes. David Hume, the famous skeptic, said, I never asserted such an absurd thing as that things can arise without a cause. They just don't happen. If they come to be, something must have caused it to come to be. Julie Andrews sang it, you remember, in The Sound of Music. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. Take something to make something. Well, if the first premise is true, is rational, what about the second one? The universe had a beginning. If the second premise is true, 
Friend, there must be a God. There must be a creator beyond the universe who made the universe. And there's more evidence for that second premise uh, than for most things uh, in science and in the modern world. Let me give you just two reasons that the universe must have had a beginning. It's running down. We're running out of usable energy. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Second reason, there cannot be an endless series of moments before today. Let's take the first one. The universe is running down. Whatever is running down is not eternal. The universe is running down, therefore the universe is not eternal. It must have had a beginning, because you can't be running down forever. Uh, take, for example, an hourglass. If all the sand is not in the bottom, what do you know for sure? That's not been going on forever. Uh, because if it was going, uh, had been going on forever, all that sand would have been in the bottom a long time ago. The universe is running down. It's running out of usable energy. Let's take your car as an example. You stop in the gas station and you fuel up. Uh, what happens? It runs down and you have to go back and fuel up. You say, well, but that energy is going somewhere. Well, if you stood by the tailpipe and by the car and you caught all of the energy coming off that car and you could convert it back into gas, it would be less gas than you started with. You'd still be running down because in the process, something is used up. It's turned into unusable heat energy. Second law of thermodynamics. Now, this law is one of the most universally established laws in all of science because in a closed, isolated system, such as the whole universe is, the amount of usable energy is decreasing. In a closed, isolated system, the amount of usable energy is decreasing. Therefore, the universe is running out of usable energy. Here's an agnostic astronomer who admitted this. He says, once hydrogen has been burned within that star and converted to heavier elements, it can never be restored to its original state. Minute by minute and year by year, as hydrogen is used up in the stars, the supply of this element in the universe grows smaller. In his book, God and the Astronomers, the universe is running out of usable energy. It had a beginning. But whatever has a beginning had a beginner. He said, the scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. This is an exceedingly strange development unexpected by all but theologians. They have always accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, when an agnostic astronomer is saying Genesis 1-1 is the answer to this question, why is energy running down, then I think uh, we have sound basis for believing that there must have been a creator of the universe. Second reason, there cannot be an endless series of moments before today. An endless series has no end. That's self-evident. But today is the end of the series of all days before today. That's obvious. Today is the last day in all the chain of days before today. But you can't have the end of an endless series. Therefore, the series of days before today is not infinite, is not endless, must have had a beginning. This particular argument was used by the Muslim philosophers, picked up by the Christian Bonaventura in the uh, late Middle Ages and was revived by William Lane Craig in our time. It's called the Kalam from the Arabic word for eternal. You can't have an eternal number of moments before today. You say, well, I took a math class and I know that you can have an infinite number of points between these two fingers. Yeah, but that's because points are abstract. They don't have any dimension. We're talking about concrete things. You can't have an infinite number of links in a chain. You can't have an infinite number of sheets of paper between these two fingers. You can't get any concrete infinite between them. Abstractly can be an infinite. We're talking about real time, the real world. There can't be an infinite chain. Now, if an endless series has no end, and today is the end of all moments before today, then time had a beginning. It must have been created, which is precisely 
uh, what Albert Einstein had to conclude to his own embarrassment. The second reason, every design has a designer. The universe and life manifest design. Therefore, the universe and life have a designer. This is one of the simplest and most uh, potent arguments for the existence of God. Every design has a designer. The universe has design. Therefore, it's design. As William Paley said, if you found a watch, let alone a Rolex watch, uh, if you're walking across the field and picked up a watch, you'd know immediately there was a watchmaker. Why? Because of its design. Because of the way all the parts are put together. Because it has a function um, telling the time. Now, the universe is far more complex than a watch. In fact, it doesn't even compare. A, a watch doesn't even compare uh, to the universe. If a watch takes a designer, how much more does the universe take a designer? Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you go into a local astronomy uh, room in your high school or college, and you see a model uh, of the solar system. Everything is going in order. It's just beautifully uh, done. And uh, the teacher is telling you how much time it took them to put this together and how much effort it took. And then when he's all through, you say to him, you know, I think that happened uh, by the wind blowing through the alley. And it picked up some of the garbage there and it just formed all this one day. And he feels insulted because it took his intelligence and all of his effort to put it together. And he says, you, know, you can't possibly believe that. But that's exactly what they believe if they don't believe in God. They have to believe that it all happened by chance with no intelligent being. They put not just a model of the solar system, but put the whole universe into operation. One of the brightest men who ever lived, obviously he stuck his finger in a socket, um, Albert Einstein, said this, the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. When you think of the harmony of natural law and you think of the mathematical nature of the universe, it must have taken a super mathematician to figure this out. No one in their right mind should deny this. But suppose your favorite cereal is alphabets. And suppose you wake up tomorrow morning and they're spilled over and it says, take out the garbage, mom. How many scientists would believe the cat knocked it over? How many atheists would believe that there was an earthquake that shook the house and did that? Is there anybody really in their right mind who would believe any natural force, the wind blowing in the window, somebody shaking the table, somebody is throwing the box up in the air and letting it fall down? Doesn't it, just a simple little message like that, take out the garbage mom, doesn't it take an intelligent being, even if it wasn't mom, even if it was your sister fooling you, still took a, an intelligent being to do it, right? Intelligent design from an intelligent being. You're lying on the beach. You look up and you see drink Coke or whatever your favorite is. Every intelligent being knows that there must have been some intelligent being behind this. No one would say, well, that's unusual. The, the wind is coming from the east today, you know. Uh, unusual cloud formation. Everybody knows how it got there. Even if you didn't see the plane do it or someone do it, you know it took an intelligent being to do it. If you're walking down the beach and you see, John loves Mary, written in the sand. Anybody believe a turtle does that? Or a fish just kind of wiggled up there and did that? And nobody believes that. Why? Because we all know it takes an intelligent being to make a simple little message. Now, how about this message? We are told that there is a genetic alphabet, a four-letter alphabet in every living thing, and that a single-cell animal, like an amoeba, protozoa, a single-cell animal, has this complex genetic code in it that is so complex that if you spelled it out in English, a one-cell animal would equal 1,000 volumes of an encyclopedia. No one in their right mind would believe that a thousand volumes of the encyclopedia resulted from an explosion in a printing shop. You know, all the print is there and everything, paper is there, 
but it doesn't.